One of our more successful engine programs is by far our LS engine program. We've had a lot of development with it, not only for street driven cars or like our Project RX-7 that's running an E-Rod, but for full out builds like the Daiyoshi Horus program that we were part of. Yeah, like Formula Drift, road racing, uh, even boats or whatever, I think we can build a pretty sick LS here. So with that said, we've had a lot of inquiries about our LS engines, how much they cost, and like many of you know, there are a ton of options for LS builds. What we're gonna go over today is what our budget long block and then also what our baller long block will cost. Uh, and we'll be mostly concentrating on the formula that we've been using here, which is the long rod LS, correct? Uh, long rod four inch stroke. Perfect. So those are the details that we're gonna get into today. Um, so with that said, Let's get into the LS. What's pretty interesting is this particular LS3 was uh, one of our customers that did a uh, S13 with the LS swap. And he put a brand new uh, GM Performance Crate LS3 in his uh, S chassis. But then he was storing it at a shop. And this shop um, literally started his car up and drove it outside and then drove it back in every single day. Now this engine had like zero uh, street and zero track hours. It was a brand new engine. Uh, my friend's really busy, so it's his play car and he didn't even get to take it out. And it was in storage, but being moved five days a week for a year and it completely destroyed the engine. Um, so that's something that's interesting, folks. If you have a car in storage, don't start it up, run for a few seconds and shut it off every day. Um, I mean, you and, the re and the reason being because this is not allowing any moisture to get out of the oil. We're diluting the oil. And basically it's like now we're running a car with water in the oil pan. Yeah, water in the oil pan. Uh, nothing's coming up to temperature. So everything's at the wrong clearances. I mean, I've seen an engine go through a season and a half of formula drift and look better than this thing. <laughs> I mean, you remember, I remember some of the things were fused. Some of the bearings were even fused together. Yeah, like the bearings were fused to the crank. Every single bearing was totally ruined. The only reason why it didn't spin is because it was just idling, but the bearing material was hammered. The, <laughs> the cylinder walls were hammered. The pistons and the rings, they were like wasted. Like, I mean, I wouldn't have believed it until I saw it, right? Agreed. So, um, I get, so what this customer wanted was uh, something that was like a stock LS3 that would have a smooth idle, uh, look stock externally, uh, but would have like a lot of torque and a wide power band. So we built him something that's optimized to produce torque, to look totally stock and to have a smooth idle. And what that translates to as well, guys, it's basically just a refresh of an engine with getting the most efficiency and power out of those constraints, of the stock constraints, without going too crazy with heavy machining or heavy porting of heads or anything like that. And it had to run on California 91 pump gas. Exactly. So let's start. Uh, the, the heart of any of LS build is the block. So we start here usually with a bare brand new LS3 block. You could potentially bring in your own if you wanted to, and we can inspect it here and see if we can work with that. Uh, well, but we'll, if, you, for, if we, for example, had to order a brand new block, the brand new block from Chevy is $1,900. On this particular motor, uh, we're able to save the block, but it did need to get reboard, so we reboarded it 10 over. You, you can't really uh, bore LS3 much over than, much more than that, but I mean, seriously, this thing, the, the bores were ruined, and this engine had zero use miles but uh, we bored the 10 over we used uh, our normal really good machining so we did it with um, with torque plates so the uh, board distortion would uh, stay uh, stay good like uh, all motors when you bolt the cylinder head on the Chevy's the uh, act of like torquing down the head actually distorts the bore so the torque plate acts like um, it, it acts like the cylinder head actually, but it has holes in so the machine tools could go in. Mm -hmm. So you stress the block just like you would in use with a, um, the torque plate, which is the dummy cylinder head bolted on. You bore it and hone it. So that way when you bolt the cylinder head on for reals, you'll have a perfectly round bore. 
Absolutely. And whether you're getting the work done with us guys or with some another shop, be sure that they're using torque plates when they're machining your blocks. Now, uh, the other thing we did is properly finish the cylinder walls. A lot of shops mess this up. Uh, like modern performance rings don't like a rough cylinder wall finish. Mm -hmm. So we did a like a, a diamond hone, 600 grit, like our, one of the finest ones you can get. But the important trick is we did plateau honing after that. Uh, plateau honing kind of uh, takes the pointy peaks off the honed surface. Uh, this way, um, the rings seat really quick. Uh, it also has lower friction and lower wear. And mm -hmm. um, it's another step a lot of shops don't, don't take. Don't so, take. Uh, proper uh, machining and proper honing is really important. So the fee for us to do that for you guys is $1,100 and that what that will include is the bore and hone. It will also include the obviously boring honing with the torque plate and then resurfacing. Um, if you need more things along the lines of like, let's say we need to uh, align board the mains or something along those lines and that'll be an additional fee. But for this purposes, we're just doing just the basic machining, 1100 bucks. A line boring is, uh, let's say you have an engine that's been used really, really hard. Uh, everything moves around, um, including the, um, the main bearing bore. Uh, sometimes those can get like out of shape, got, like get egg shaped or out of position. So basically a, a line boring, you shave the caps just a little bit and then um, you run a you run a hone right through there and it straightens out and uh, makes your, your main bores all nice and round again. Well, we try to avoid it. Uh, LS engines are really good. They have um, uh, four bolt mains and they're cross bolted. Um, so you generally don't see it in LSs too much, but um, hey, we check it on every single engine we build. Exactly. So, uh, it, it probably won't need to be done on LS, but you never know. Then after we're done with the block, then the next thing is the crank and, and rods. Uh, for our setup, again, like we mentioned earlier, we're trying to basically get the most power out of the constraints that we're working with, and we went with the stroker setup from Eagle, correct? Uh, yes, like uh, our customer wanted a uh, sleeper torquer motor, so we built him our 418 cubic inch combo. Um, so this is like a 10 over block. Um, a uh, four inch stroke and uh, that gives you 418 cubic inches which is a lot for that tiny package it's only um, you know it's nine less than an LS7 for instance mm -hmm. nine cubic inches but uh, our secret sauce like uh, you know we could do with expensive parts or uh, value parts so we went with value parts on this motor so we used an, an Eagle crank uh, it's made out of 4340 which is a high nickel high chromium steel that's really tough, perfect for cranks. Um, it's a machine from a, um, like a blank forging out of that. And I mean, even though Eagle is a fairly, uh, it, I wouldn't say cheap brand, but it's not like the most expensive yeah, one. very affordable. Uh, we've always had them measure out perfectly. Uh, we've had some of these Eagle cranks in like super abusive conditions like pro drift cars and uh, they hold up just fine. And uh, we also do like to go with the ESP armor from Eagle, correct? Yeah, that's a, um, ESP armor is a process that Eagle does. It's like an option. It, it basically makes everything super shiny like chrome. Um, that gives you more fatigue strength, uh, less windage losses, sheds oil, uh, reduces friction on the bearing journals. Plus it looks cool. <laughs> Um, so ESP armor is a cool feature that uh, we do for some customers if they want it. Um, we use uh, Eagle connecting rods for this sort of build. They're made out of the same uh, tough high nickel chromium alloy. Uh, they're, a, uh, they're a forging machined in the USA and they use ARP 2000 bolts. Uh, they're I-beam construction. They have a lot of cool little features like uh, this little rib you can see in here. I guess they found through analysis that that actually gives a lot of strength, even though that's a little thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the small end has dual pin oilers. So you can see there's two uh, oiling holes like down here. A, a lot of brands put their oiling hole up at top. And up here is the most, one of the most highly stressed parts of the rod. And uh, 
you know, if you drill a hole in there, you're weakening it, right? So instead of oh, one big okay. hole up here, they put two little holes down in here where, um, you know, like the, the beam can give it stiffness. So that's a little trick. Um, high silicon bronze bushing. Uh, you know, like these are fairly inexpensive rods, but they're damn good. Like uh, we've never had a bit of trouble. Um, like in our super, uh, like abusive condition, we might get their optional rod, um, rod with the- uh, Oh, the better with, uh, hardware. Yeah, with the ARP 625 volts. Uh, but ARP 2000 is more than strong enough for um, probably up to 1,000 horsepower maybe. Um, but you do have that option. So that brings us to a good question. With all things being equal, um, is there any reason why a customer shouldn't go with our long rod stroker setup? Um, well, I think if they're concerned about fuel economy, maybe. Okay. And, uh, or if they're racing in a class where you can't do that. Or um, I, there isn't too many drawbacks. Um, well, I guess there's some that we've kind of countered with the way we put things together. Like uh, one of the things is when you stroke a LS block, um, the skirt of the piston can a actually poke out beyond the bore. Oh, yeah. And you get this weird um, wavy um, wear pattern in the bore. So, um, you know, it's our belief that we, you should never go beyond a four inch stroke with a stock LS block for that reason. Um, I guess some of the other things we do is uh, we use a longer than stock rod. Mm -hmm. So we run the six 125 rod and that's about the longest that we can stuff in the LS and not disrupt the ring package too much and still have um, you know, enough uh, ring land thickness there. Uh, the longer rod uh, uh, causes less dig into the cylinder walls, which is important uh, with the stroke because the stroke tends to cause that to happen, more thrust load um, on the sides of the bore. So we're lessening the travel of the piston and that's why there's not no, it's, uh, it's a longer rod, so like the sine wave of like um, piston speed per uh, degree of crank rotation. Well, let's put it to normal people language, and as this is moving up and down in the cylinders, what is the long rod doing? It, it causes less angularity. If you had a short rod, it Perfect. would be like, like this, and there it would go. be really scrubbing into the walls. But the longer rod is more like this. You know, of course, this is super exaggerated. Yeah. Um, but uh, but that, that's a good visualization of what the longer rod is doing. And the, with the long rod, the piston accelerates a, uh, away from TDC a little bit slower. Like the uh, sine curve of the piston velocity is more rounded instead of pointy. Mm -hmm. so, oh, so it dwells up there a little bit so longer. So it dwells up there a little bit longer. Um, it puts less stress on the rod bolts and the piston pin. Um, and the rod, uh, so it's a little bit less stress. And also you get a little bit longer time to fill the cylinders, so it helps your VE, VE a little bit. And also the explosion uh, on the power stroke has more time to kind of impinge on the top of the piston and transfer that energy okay. as the piston starts to go down. So it helps efficiency a little bit. So you have less mechanical stress, uh, less friction, a little bit more volumetric efficiency and a little bit more uh, thermal efficiency. Okay. Now where you had originally mentioned a slight decrease in MPG, now what is that a function of? Uh, just having a bigger engine. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so for that, oh, the stroker portion of it. And yeah. Gotcha. Okay, so with that said, now you're probably asking what are the price for this, at least for the combo that we talked about, which is the Eagle crank with the four inch stroke and then also our longer Eagle rods. The crank is 950 and the rod set is 550. Now, of course, there are thousands of options, guys, that you can buy. So you can assume that the price of your rod setup or even your crank will likely be right around the same price range. Uh, so after that, let's move on to our pistons, which we're using JE FSR pistons and uh, the Ultra pistons. Yeah, uh, we're running the JE Ultra pistons. The Ultra pistons are cool because they come with uh, ceramic thermobaric coating on the top and anti-friction coating on the side. Mm -hmm. um, they also um, have premium features like the uh, FSR uh, piston configuration. 
So it's kind of like a, um, here, let me show you. It's like a, kind of like a slipper skirt. Mm -hmm. But then uh, the thrust side is, is wider than the uh, non-thrust side. So um, you, you get more area where you need it. You know, the thrust side is where the piston gets pushed into the cylinder wall. So having like a little thin guy is going to wear out and put more point mm -hmm. contact loading. But uh, you, you have the uh, wide skirt where you need it. And on the side that's not loaded so much, it's narrow, so it's less weight, less friction. Uh, the FSR forging also has um, these flying buttresses here that uh, couple the uh, pin boss into the whole rest of the piston. Okay. Like a lot of pistons uh, that are slipper skirt like this don't have this, so there's like a, the combustion pressure just kind of pushes and tends to distort the piston like that. Um, these flying buttresses help keep everything nice and, uh, you know, keeps the loading even. Uh, the pin boss is the most highly stressed part of the piston, and pin boss failure is an issue on, like, highly stressed engines. So all this stuff reinforces the pin boss. So even though everything is all milled down and lightweight, the pin boss area is still really strong. Um, the ultra pistons have, like, a near net shape forging. So it doesn't require uh, much secondary milling on the bottom or anything. And because of this, you get really good grain flow. Um, uh, so the grain flow is all around in here. A lot of forged pistons are just like a forged chunk of aluminum with a lot of CNC machining. Okay. Uh, th um, this thing is like almost squished into the shape it's going to be. So you get all that forged, good grain flow, good grain refinement goodness. and. Uh, grain um, going in the direction of stress and all well, that. I hear what you're saying. You're not starting off necessarily with a block, a cube. Like it's a cube. It's more a, like, almost e squished into the almost final shape. Yeah, so you get the, the grain flow. So grain is kind of like grain in the wood. Mm -hmm. And you like, you can snap wood across the grain super easy, but if you like pull on the grain, it's really strong, mm -hmm. right? So when you get a near net shape forging like this, the grain of the, metal is going all in the right direction for the most strength. Gotcha. Um, one cool thing about this piston too is the skirt profile is designed specifically for the uh, four inch stroke in the LS block because you notice the skirts are really short. Mm -hmm. So these skirts won't go beyond the bottom of the uh, bore so you don't get that uncontrolled rocking. And the uh, cam of the piston is designed to control that rocking while it's in the bore. Um, the cam is uh, kind of like this shape when it's really exaggerated, so it kind of helps ease the piston around the okay. bore. Um, so even though these are pretty short looking skirts, you'll still get good uh, stability in the bore. Um, and, and you won't get that rocking thing. So uh, you, you've probably seen the rocking wear in some customer engines that we refreshed yeah, in the racing motors. Yeah, and, this is uh, Jay's answer to control a lot of that. Um, since we're running a longer rod, they had to put the, uh, the, the pin um, bore right into the oil ring, if you notice that. Oh, and that's that. how we have the additional support rail on the ring package. Yeah, so they have that thin support rail. Um, and, uh, you know, like, we, you know, we've done this in kind of a lot of motors uh, that we've done the long rod combo, and we've never had a problem with oil consumption mm -hmm. or anything. So, you know, it looks kind of scary, but I think that's a, <laughs> that's a good deal. Um, other cool features is um, the FSR piston has these lateral gas ports. Uh, so this helps some of that combustion pressure get behind the number one ring. Uh, the ring is a really low tension, really thin ring, but this helps get the uh, gas pressure behind there and helps uh, ring seal at okay. high RPM. Um, it has this uh, pressure accumulation groove between the number one and number two compression rings. Uh, this also helps get, uh, acts like a reservoir for uh, pressure to help pressurize the number two ring and help that thing seal too. And it has this uh, support ring, oil ring that we talked about. Um, some other advanced features are the piston has uh, twin oilers. So these two holes here get oil that's scraped from the cylinder wall by the oil ring and actually kind of pressure feed it into the piston pin. 
So this helps keep this area really well lubricated. It's twin oilers with this lateral groove. The groove acts like a reservoir to hold some of that oil in. So you're not gonna have any problems with the uh, piston pin seizing. Uh, the rings, it's the number one ring is a super thin, uh, lightweight uh, steel ring with a, uh, it's nitrided. Uh, nitrided is a, a process that converts the surface of uh, a ferrous metal to uh, iron nitride, which is almost like a hard, slippery ceramic. Um, the second ring is ductile iron, but it's a uh, napier profile, so it, it has kind of like a hook on it. That little hook thing wears into the bore really quick and uh, breaks in super fast and gives like good backup seal to okay. the number one ring. Um, yeah, this is like a really trick piston and you know what's even better is JE has these things on, on the shelf. And at a great value, man. I mean, I think it's, it's only 965 for the setup for this piston set. Yeah, it's like maybe a hundred bucks more than uh, just their... Yeah, for the additional features that you get right off the box. I mean, the coatings, um, the FSR design, yeah, it's a slam dunk. I mean, yeah, this is, used to be a custom spec piston that you would have to wait, wait a few weeks to get made, but I mean, here it is on the shelf. And, and one question I'm sure some of you may have that are familiar with their videos and our processes here is, well, what about WPC and cryo treatment for these pistons if they're already all coated and everything? Well, there are additional things you can do. I mean, for the most part, it is a pretty right out of the box you can use piston, but for our super trick builds, for example, we can take the additional step of WPCing the pin area and the pin itself. So what we would do is um, um, WPC in the pin board, the WPC the pin, uh, we'd mask the piston off so we wouldn't take off the coatings and we'd WPC in the area of the rings. Most importantly, we'd WPC in the ring grooves because, um, you know, micro welding of the rings is always a problem, mm -hmm. especially like in boosted engines. Micro welding is like fretting when you get a piece of metal and rub it really hard into another metal under heat and pressure and maybe a little lack of oil. The, the two metal surfaces tend to uh, weld into each other or gall into each other. And it's on the small scale and that's called um, micro welding. And when you get micro welding of your compression rings, they kind of stick and you lose a lot of ring seal and power. Uh, so what WPC does is like it really works to prevent the micro welding. So it keeps the rings moving freely and keeps your engine making power. Yep. And of course, it's all per application if your engine's gonna, depending on what you're gonna be using it for. And also, you know, speed is money. How much, do you, how fast do you wanna go is always what we say. Here. And durability too. Absolutely. I mean, like what I always talk about is how, um, you know, like a race motor with forged pistons and all that is a lot stronger than a stock motor, but it's not always longer lasting from it's a wear durable. standpoint. Yes. Yeah. Because of the metals that you're using and a lot of the, Maybe explain that, uh, the reason between the forged pistons and your regular stock pistons. Well, like your stock pistons generally nowadays is what you call a hypertectic alloy. And it's like really high silicon and uh, that's good. Um, it doesn't expand much, so uh, you can keep tight clearances so you don't have much rattling around. That helps with wear. The silicon is like kind of like a hard element within the aluminum matrix. So that highly resists wear. Um, it's also pretty good for friction. Um, the only drawback with that is it's super brittle. So turbo boost, high compression, any kind of detonation will kill those pistons right now, away. Now, how do they compare weight-wise? Um, so hypertectic is a little bit less dense, so the piston's kind of lighter, but you know, they're generally full skirt and not all like pared down. Okay. So the weight is pretty equivalent. Uh, plus, hypertectic isn't as strong, so you need to have more material around the pin boss and stuff, for instance. Um, so that weight savings in material of one to one kind of is out. Yeah. It balances out by the amount that you're going to have to have more material anyway. Usually, like an ultra piston will be lighter than okay. any stock piston. But, um, you know, like the uh, race pistons made out of uh, 2618, and that's a low silicon alloy. Um, you know, it's ductile, it's tough, flexible, uh, it's really strong, but it's also kind of soft and almost gummy. So it's not gonna wear like a hyperutectic piston. So like, 
you know, like if you have an old Toyota, 300,000, half a million miles out of those sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if you have like a all forged race motor, if you get 100,000 on the street, that's pretty good. So there's a difference between uh, wearability and strength. Something to think about when you're making up your build, guys. Now, something that we don't, uh, that there's really not something that we cut any corners on are bearings. Um, like any of our other builds, we mostly try to use King Racing for our bearings. We had great luck with them. And in this case, we're gonna be using their coated line of bearings. Uh, yeah, the King coated bearings, um, their coating, like most other companies, is usually some kind of polymer. Uh, usually it's uh, molybdenum in a resin matrix or something like that. But uh, King's is a little different. Like they, they have some polymer in there for slipperiness, but they also have uh, part of, uh, copper nanoparticles. Now copper is a really lubricious kind of metal and the nanoparticles are really, really tiny. And they're almost like little um, solid film lubricant things. Oh, okay. And, and so the, the King coating, uh, instead of just giving some slipperiness actually increases the bearing capacity of the of the the load bearing capacity of the bearing like maybe a, you know up to 10 percent nice and uh generally uh most coatings don't increase the load bearing capacity at all uh we really like king bearings uh we've had engines that have seen like a season of tough use we tear them down and the bearings are still okay mm -hmm. which is really unusual now, for your, for your build, you should budget about $300 for bearings, and that's for your mains and your connecting rods. Depending on how things work out, we may have to buy another set of mains or rods if we need to go with a standard size, mix them up with maybe an oversize. It just depends on where the clearances fall for your build. But you know, you, uh, the way it breaks down is actually 130 for the mains and 160 for the rods at this time. Um, like right now, with supply chain issues, uh, you know, sometimes you might have to substitute bearings or you, you might be waiting yeah. six months for bearings and I'm not joking either. Yeah, where we have an, a complete engine bill just sitting around for one set of bearings or, or one part. It, actually, any of these parts in this entire build, LS parts have been becoming very hard to get recently. Yeah, COVID's a bitch. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if we can't get King, uh, we'll still use ACL or we'll use Clevite. Those are all very, very good bearings. Um, and uh, one of the things about ACL and Clevite is you can actually WPC them. And when you WPC those bearings, the load bearing capacity can go up like 20%. So that's an option. With King, uh, with the coating, WPCing might damage the coating, so we don't do that. But uh, you, you could still get a really good combo, uh, WPC and... Should we have to use a non-coated bearing? Right. For bearing clearances, um, some LSs like LS3s or LS7s have alloy blocks and these engines, if you're on the forums and stuff or you have much experience, they always run really low oil pressure. Um, and to us, like maybe that's fine with close to stock power, but if you're running serious power and you're running um, uh, under tough conditions, uh, you know, that's not acceptable. We like to see uh, higher oil pressure. So one of the things we do is uh, we select fit the bearings and we mix and match different bearing sets to uh, get the clearance so we can run like on the tighter side of stock. This helps uh, prevent the uh, loss of oil pressure. Like what happens if you have an alloy block is they expand a lot with heat. It expands and you lose some of your uh, clearance and then the oil pressure drops. And, it's uh, something we see like for almost with any alloy block when uh, used hard, like something like drifting or road racing where everything gets, mm -hmm. gets really hot. Um, uh, if it's a really high horsepower, like a turbo motor, um, we might not tighten up the clearances because on those high horsepower motors, things move around and uh, you, know, you can actually damage the bearings if you run them too tight because you're crank and your block and everything are flexing, but generally, if it's a hot NA motor or a mild turbo or supercharger motor, we run things tighter. Um, I guess when you get to a certain power level and you have to loosen up the clearings, uh, clearance is about the only thing that'll keep the engine lubricated right is the dry sump. The dry sump. But that's when you're getting into 
four-digit power there. Um, the other thing we do is we run a high volume oil pump. So there's all kinds of oil pumps you can run, but if you have a serious, pretty serious LS build, um, we run the Melling high volume uh, pump at, for the, uh, the VVT motor. So this has like uh, about 20% more than a normal Melling's high volume pump. Uh, and it's about 50% more volume than your stock pump. Um, and it's about uh, 20 PSI more pressure. So this kind of helps handle some of the lack of oil. Um, one of the things when you run a big a pump this big, I mean, this is the second best thing you can get to a dry sump is uh, it could suck your oil pan dry. So your stock oil pump is, I mean, your stock oil pan is probably no bueno. You have to have a high capacity, high capacity pan, pan and windage tray and a crank scraper to get all that oil back. Um, I guess another one of these things about the regular LS blocks is that they're non-priority mains. So that means they have their main oil galley and then they feed the top end and the bottom end of the engine from there. Um, like these aftermarket racing blocks like this RHS one down there have what you call priority mains. So it feeds the main bearings first and then takes the bleed oil from the mains and oils the top end. Mm -hmm. That's the way to go for a performance engine. Um, but with the non-priority mains, having a sufficient uh, volume and pressure oil pump is really it's important. It's a must. Yeah, because you're not feeding the mains directly. And uh, Mellings does have different options as to the oil pressures and even like Mike said, a high volume or a normal volume one, depending on your application. Whether you're not going to go with an aftermarket pan, you probably necessarily may not want to go with a super high volume pump. Um, but one of the things a lot of engine builders that uh, you know, all the good ones know this, but a lot of the, like your local shop guy kind of guys, they don't know about that non-priority main and uh, yeah, they might, they might not set your clearances up right and not give you enough uh, oil pump volume. And if they do, they might not know about the pan not holding enough. <laughs> so um, sometimes it kind of helps to go with people that have a little bit more experience with actual racing. Indeed. And to, to, to finish off with the pricing of the milling pump, it's about 175 for the high volume, high pressure pump. Again, they do have other options and they range around the same price. Um, less, uh, then also, not lastly, but also, let's talk about hardware for our engine, which is we get it for ARP for both our mains and our heads. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, like this engine is like, kind of like stock plus, um, you know, it's not crazy stock compression. Sure, it's a stroker and kind of big cubic inch, but we're running the uh, factory torque to yield bolts. And when you're building an engine that's not too crazy, that doesn't need total um, sealing, like, um, you know, even kind of a healthy, naturally aspirated engine, uh, torque to yield bolts actually have some advantages. Like um, when you put like a solid ARP stud in there, um, you know, that thing's solid and the aluminum block, the coefficient of expansion of aluminum is twice that of a solid stud. So as the block heats up and grows and the head heats up and grows, uh, it's growing twice as fast as that stud. So you're actually getting um, like more point stress, you're getting more bore distortion, uh, you're not putting such an even clamp load on your head gasket. Um, Depending on the temp your operating temperature. Yeah, so the torque to yield bolts are kind of designed to have some spring and to kind of like allow that growth without so much distortion of the block. That's why the OEMs use it. But the bad thing about those is that you can only reuse them maybe once and then they permanently stretch and lose their stuff. And that's another thing that engine builders that maybe don't know what they're doing so much do. They keep reusing the bolts. Next thing you know, you have your head lifting or you even pull the threads out of the block mm -hmm. or something. Um, but the studs, um, you know, like I kind of say only need the studs if you, if you need them. So, you know, like a serious, like- Need them in a boosted, in like in a boosted engine? Or a serious naturally aspirated, you know, like 13 to one. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, high RPM, super abusive. And, 
in, in that case, you know, like the, the clamping load and, and all that, the studs is what is what will get you through. You know, even though some of the other things, it's a little compromised, your ring seal might not be as good. And, um, you know, you have that point load consideration, so you might have to do more exotic things to, like, um, like O-ring your, your block or something. But uh, it, it's generally only need studs when you use studs when you need them. Okay. Studs are always good for the mains though, but for the heads, you know, there's always that consideration. Well, all right. So with that said, your LSARP studs were about 235. And then if you really do need the head stud, it's another 335. Um, then after that, let's get into our, you know, the, the regular prices for your, for your short block, which are the parts that you really need. Your Chevy gasket kit for all the gaskets that come in and, and rebuild, you should budget about $300 for that. And then there's also two little pieces that we get that are uh, billet pieces, which is for the oil pickup brace. And then also the, um, the little oil diverter things, usually yeah, made out yeah. of plastic. Yeah, God, what do you call that thing? I think it is an old, I, I think they, some people call it a dog bone thing, but yeah, it's the oil diver plunger looking thing. Thing, yeah, you gotta get that. So we get that made out of billets, so both of those pieces are $25 each. Uh, they're, just, they're just good insurance. I mean, again, that little plunger thing could, if it breaks, and could really ruin your day. Um, for head gaskets, we really like these uh, Pro Seal gaskets. Uh, JE sells them. Uh, they're an MLS, multi-layer stainless, so they're made out of stainless steel with some bossing, and they have like a um, little little extra layer in there to put more clamp around the cylinders. Um, they're coated with some kind of polymer coating, so um, uh, it helps conform into like some of your machining marks on your deck, and, and it's a nice gasket for a good price. Um, if you wanted to get really serious, like uh, there's more exotic gaskets to be had, like let's say you're running a forced induction um, with like a folded stopper layer and stuff, uh, like Cometic makes some of that, but those are way more money. So for a build like this, this is uh, shoot, a way more than adequate gasket. So naturally aspirated, um, not boosting too much. These, these are a great gasket and a great value. And the JE Pro Seal head gaskets are coming in at $140 each. Well, I have two, two sides on a V8, so $280 you should budget for. Um, and then from there, we'll go into really what makes a big difference in the performance of the engine. Your power band is the camshaft. And we've, had, we've been normally using some comp cams. They have, they have a lot of options. And not only that, they also even come with a master kit, which includes your, 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 the timing gear, the the chain for it so it just makes it really easy and a nice little package what we like about comp cams is you know like martin said they have uh, good value packages that are all together with match components for like street engines this particular uh, engine the owner wanted to smooth idle so we have a cam that um, is only a little bigger than stock um, it, it mostly has almost the stock duration but uh like a, a healthier amount of lift Mm -hmm. um, and the lobe separation angle, which makes that uh, lumpy idle, is almost the same as stock. So it's like, I would say even the Chevy Performance 525 cam is bigger than this one. Um, but it's a nice mild cam, like one up from stock. But uh, what we like about Comp is that they have a grind for almost everything. And when we, they're doing, they're really willing to work with us and make custom grinds for uh, special spec engines uh, like we had for the Formula Drift engine we had like a big single turbo um, it has a little bit more back pressure than maybe like a twin so I had them make a custom grind with a little bit more lobe separation uh, but you know they're really w willing to work with us um, they make the, they can make a custom grind for us so if you have that special engine with special requirements uh, we can get the perfect cam from them and they have quick turnaround. And again, guys, they make a really nice complete kit um, for the cam and the master kit for the cam is about $2,000. Now, of course, if you wanted to stick with the stock cam, uh, just keep in mind that you'll have to go, you'll have to also make sure that you add up for 
uh, lifters, valve springs, retainers, valve seals, things of that sort that come with the kit already. Um, so that's pretty much. You should always change the timing chain too. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that comes with it. It's the gear and the <coughs> chains that come with the kit. Um, that is pretty much the bulk of the parts. So if we're to add up everything we've talked about here, that we are at about $8,000 for that. And then we'll get into the basics of the labor, which is our engine assembly which is about $4,800. Then we're looking at balancing of the internal assembly, which is your pistons, rods, um, and crank. That's another 150 bucks. And lastly, we have what we talked about in the beginning of the video, the machine shop. That's about $800 for basic machining, which is the bore boring of the engine, of the block, and then also resurfacing the, the mating surfaces for the heads. Now, if there is additional Machine that needs to be done, for example, the line boring that we talked about, there is an additional fee for that, but we can talk about that once we've already have your block in hand and have inspected it. Um, so with that said, really, then we can get into heads. Uh, let me finish off by saying that for your basic rebuild, if we wanted to do a basic head refresh, um, that is about $1,100. That does not include changing of, for example, your valve guides, which are the gold guides here. That's really what's controlling the shaft play, uh, but, it we, but we will be replacing the valve seals. So again, that's $1,100, um, but now we do have two different head setups here, which is just your stock head that came with your LS3 E-Rod, and then an all-pro, all-out head. And I'll switch sides here with Mike so he can kind of explain the differences between the two. So for this customer, you know, like he doesn't want huge power. He just basically wants something pretty close to stock and uh, that's reliable. And you know, the whole engine was screwed up, but the heads are still kind of okay. So what we basically did is went in and did our basic, um, or our trick new and radius valve job. Uh, you know, this helps probably on the V8. It probably gives 50 horsepower. Um, the new in valve job, uh, it, it cuts like a nice radius from the combustion chamber to the 45 and the smooth radius um, into the valve bowl. So it, it actually matches the valve seat to the, to the bowl of the port. Um, it's almost like match doing bowl work when porting. It probably gives like maybe two thirds of the gain of a fully ported bowl just in the valve job. So we like doing that. Uh, we can also do a good three angle valve job with a surty valve machine that's a little cheaper. Um, you know, it's still a solid valve job that's going to give you some power. Um, you know, there's options if you want. We could uh, hand blend the, uh, the, the, the top cut into the, uh, the, the, we can hand blend the combustion chamber into your top cut and then uh, your 70 degree bottom cut, we can blend that into the uh, bowl and we can uh, clean up the short side radius of the port. That probably gives you about 75 or 70, 75 percent of the advantages of a full no. por fully ported head for a fraction of the cost. Oh, we didn't do that to this because uh, the owner didn't want to go crazy. <laughs> um, but that's like options on a stock uh, head. Uh, other options are we can get your head CNC ported, although we kind of almost don't recommend that because you can get really good aftermarket heads that um, you know actually have uh, really good flowing ports. Um, so if it's a not too esoteric motor like our uh, 650 horsepower motor that you might have seen in the video, um, we like TFF, TSF uh, heads for those kind of things because uh, of a stock configuration head. That's one of the best flowing ones, and it's a really nice price. So I always feel like that's a really good bang for the buck uh, head. And, you know, we make 650 horsepower pretty easy, naturally aspirated with that head. So those are the options for your stock, your stock heads that we can do. Uh, for the purposes of this pricing, what we've done is just a basic new and valve job. It did not need new valve guides. That was all actually in good condition. So just the new and valve job is the $1,100 we talked about. So that puts us at a grand total of about $14,000 for our budget build. So what that will include is new block, all the parts necessary, aftermarket parts and stock parts, and the stock heads with the new and valve job. So 14 grand for the budget LS Lombok. Now we'll get into some of the 
more expensive parts for our more baller builds. Uh, well, I guess another thing too is that, you know, like even though this is uh, kind of a budget build, it's still a stroker crank. It's still a brand new block. Mm -hmm. um, you could probably actually, like if you didn't want to stroke it, that's a lot less money. Like let's say somebody just has a Vortec on their car, right? And they just want pistons and rods and the solid rebuild to uh, handle the boost, right? Mm -hmm. And they're maybe running 14 pounds of boost. We could just do pistons and rods, uh, good bearings, and it would be a lot less. And with what Mike just mentioned, that is completely correct. So you can really take what we talked about regarding labor and then put any combination of parts that you want to use and you'll have a perfectly good idea what your rebuild will cost. Labor, whether we're using aftermarket pistons or aftermarket rods or stock block or stock cams, that's all going to cost the exact same amount of money to put together. Um, there are some items that cost more when you're going out to aftermarket, but we'll talk about that as Mike talks about the more developed head program. So, you know, that's our basics, but if you want to get um, like something special, um, we get into the realm of kind of esoteric. So like, let's say you wanted to do a max effort NA motor. I mean, I think it's a bit much of a cylinder head to go for force induction. I don't think generally you need to go this crazy unless you really had to go this crazy. Mm -hmm. But um, for like an all out uh, NA motor, we, we like to use all pro heads. Now these are some of the best flowing LS heads on the market. Um, Shoot, they have so many cool things. Like they have um, co uh, copper beryllium valve seats. They have like uh, huge ports. They're all CFD design. They have a really good fast combustion chamber with a lot of quench. Uh, they change the valve angles. Um, so the valves are canted. So you, the, the ports can get a better shot at the combustion chamber. Um, there's a lot of cool things in these. They're expensive and they use kind of a non-standard rocker system. So, uh, and they use a non-standard valve stem, like the valve stem's smaller than standard. So you have to get non-standard valves, non-standard retainers, non-standard keepers, and uh, kind of a non-standard um, uh, rocker system. Like uh, maybe you can order, special order it from Jezel or Crower and it, you have to say, oh, I need the all pro rocker arm configuration. And these heads would be for all out naturally aspirated effort. Or all, all out anything, but oh. mostly naturally aspirated. If you have a head like, a, like an RHS head or a TFS head, that's all based on stock Chevy architecture. So it uses Chevy configuration rockers, uh, Chevy configuration valves and valve lengths, Chevy configuration springs. So if, that motor messes up, you can get parts anywhere, but this all pro stuff is, you have to get it from all pro or, uh, you know, the valves ha have to be made from a, from a valve manufacturer. Um, yeah. It's not easy to replace some parts. Yeah, I mean, all pro could fix these all day and they have the parts, <laughs> but you have one part supplier versus many and you have something that's off the shelf and this is a little bit tweaky, but if you wanted to build like a super sick, like a 900 horsepower NA LS, we'd be using these suckers. Or and those suckers go for $4,700 for the pair, by the way. But uh, yeah, it's all in the head basically, uh, once you get to a certain point. Um, but that's kind of beyond the scope of what we're doing uh, for what most people want to spend, but it's all doable. Yep. Uh, we talked about dry sump systems. Um, once you get to a certain uh, power level, especially uh, big power turbo motors where you have to run the bigger clearances, um, about the only thing that will keep those things lubed is a good dry sump. Like uh, we use daily and the daily dry sumps between seven and maybe seven and nine thousand dollars depending on how many stages and mm -hmm. but that's a badass system. Um, it's all integrated into the pan and it's nice and clean and works super awesome. Now, while we're talking about heads and we get away from heads, let's quickly touch on one, the roller lifters that we can do the upgrade with. And then also what you had mentioned, uh, the shaft rocker setup too. Um, that's another thing, um, a mild engine like this, we use uh, a hydraulic roller cam. 
Uh, we use like a performance hydraulic roller. Um, I guess one of the main things is that we use like a low lash hy hydraulic uh, roller lifter. Low lash means that um, the hydraulic um, lash adjusting part doesn't have that much travel. Uh, one of the disadvantages to a hydraulic system, you don't have to worry about adjusting your valves, right? But then mm -hmm. um, that uh, hydraulic cushion part, uh, like on a stock roller lifter, when you get to high RPM, you're getting close to valve float. The lifters pump up and that chamber fills all the way up with oil and then the valves don't close all the way and then you start getting misfires and valve flows. It's not fast enough for the valve chain speed. Yeah. So when you get like a really radical cam profiles um, and high RPM, changes in RPM, you have to go to like a solid lifter cam and that's like a mechanical lifter where it's solid and there's none of the hydraulic stuff. You have to adjust the lash. So when you hear people talk about a solid lifter cam, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. So for our, our, our more high performance builds, especially our drift motors, we go to um, like a solid, solid lifter. Um, we also go to like uh, roller rockers. Mm -hmm. Roller rockers, instead of having a sliding trunnion, they have a needle bearings. Uh, it's a lot less friction and the motion ratio stays consistent throughout the stroke. Um, you also get more valve train stability. You probably get about 20 or 30 horsepower less friction. Um, and for our extreme motors, like the Formula Drift ones, where they're banging off the rev limiter, RPM's changing. Uh, drift cars, when they hook it, sometimes the engine almost wants to spin backwards. Um, puts a lot of stress on the valve train. Uh, we use what's called a shaft rocker. Uh, the shaft rocker, the rockers are in the shaft, so they can't rotate and skid off the valves. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is if you're running kind of uh, something, a, a casting with a really high port, like an LS7 type port, or even LS3s do this, a uh, really radical cam puts so much stress on the studs that it actually cracks the, um, the rocker boss into the intake port. And I, we've seen that a lot on like drift motors. So the shaft rocker actually spreads the load out over uh, several pedestals. So I've never seen a shaft rocker crack into the intake port. So that's important for extreme use. So extreme use would be drifting for sure, road racing, uh, boat motors. So high RPM situations. Yeah, a boat motor is another severe case. You know, the engine's at full load, full send all the time. But then when the boat bounces and the prop comes out of the water, the revs shoot to the moon and it's bouncing off the rev limiter. And then when it comes back down. It comes down, down it goes, huh, and yep. it catches and uh, puts all kinds of stress on everything. Almost like a sand rail too, I guess, when or, you're or, taking sweet jumps. Or off-road racing yeah. trucks. Uh, so drifting, off-road racing, boats, they put like, like drag racing is almost nothing because that's only a few seconds. Uh, Road racing, you're on the throttle for like, you know, like minutes. Bonneville, you're on the throttle for minutes. Um, and road racing, the engine has to hold up for maybe a couple hours every day um, and do that twice in the race weekend. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are serious motors that, that really have to be well thought out. I guess that's another thing, right, that we keep on you know, and, and YouTube and the comments, uh, someone goes, well, I can build an eBay motor and they'll put out 1,500 horsepower and you guys are full of crap. But it's like, for how long? Yep. A dyno pull, a, a couple of blasts on the street, maybe a quick freeway pull. That's mm -hmm. not real racing. That's just screwing around. You know, we, we build our stuff to, 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 to hold to last, up. To not only that, with our LS program, we've actually proved it now with many different builds, uh, street builds, uh, track builds, drift builds, all the way from amateur to professional levels. Yeah, so like those YouTube commenters, um, you know, we'd like to see, you never heard of them even racing because the, their stuff wouldn't even yeah. last a couple laps. Hooning on the street doesn't count. Yep. Um, so with all those details of the heads, uh, just to give you an idea of what these costs are, before, actually before we total it up, let's talk about the 
the last part of the process or an important part of the process that we do with a lot of our high performance builds and what sets apart the, bu the budget and the baller builds is the cryo and the WTPC treatments. Now you've heard of us talk about both of these treatments on many different videos. You can go back on the search and you know look for our WPC videos, look for our cryo treatment videos. Uh, the cost to do the bores, crank, pistons, rings, rods, cam, and valve springs for WPC is $2,750. For the same parts but cryo treatment is $2,300 so that is a, a big cost difference so once we add up the head you know high performance head options with the high performance <coughs> cam the roller rock the, the shaft rocker system and even the the mechanical lifters you're looking now more at your at your build being closer to $28,000 as opposed to our budget build is closer to $13,14. I guess some of the things about that is um you know, if you're really racing, um, and you know, when you're racing, it's not just the cost of the car, but it's the cost to transport the car someplace. It's your entry fee. It's the cost to transport your crew out there. Um, fuel costs, food costs, lodging costs. Time. Uh, time. Uh, it all adds up, and the DNF is super, super costly. And a lot of times, one DNF can cost your whole, mm -hmm. you, your whole season. Um, so it's like uh, the, a, a minor cost when it's stuff like that. And we've generally seen like a race motor, like, like one of our race motors can last a season of pretty tough racing, but it's pretty used up at the end of the season. But with WPC and cryo, a lot of times um, the same motor can go a season and a half even. And, and most of the time it just needs a little refresh, a little barren refresh, maybe even just a ring package refresh and they're good to go. Um, you know, a lot of times too is that like a lot of other engine builders, uh, they go to two, two, three, four engines a season. And, you know, we, we never had any of our engines last less than one, I don't think. And what Mike and I are talking about, again, are professional racing efforts. Um, but for your everyday build, it's the same thing though. I mean, yes, you don't have the cost of crew necessarily, but it sucks to go through the process of putting your car on a trailer, going to the track, driving to the track, and then all of a sudden your day is over because of a minor incident. And that, that's where this is really the insurance that you're purchasing when you're buying these processes for your engine builds. So if you have a serious effort, I mean, you're spending a minimum of 10 grand just to be there. The cost is just exponential compared to the novice guy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, uh, you know, like when you compare it to your transportation costs and your entry fee and all that, that's a big investment. And if that gets thrown away, that's, that's a significant, mm -hmm. significant loss there. Another thing we also have to talk about and the big difference between your baller and your budget builds is what you're starting off with in your, with your block. Uh, the difference between your stock LS3 block and your higher performance RHX block that is meant to take a lot more horsepower. So let's take a look at those. So when we're talking about uh, really cool builds, like really big power, um, the stock LS3 block starts to get a little bit inadequate. Um, the stock LS3 block is probably good for maybe something like 14 pounds of boost and uh, maybe about 800 horsepower for long-term use. Uh, some of the reasons for that is it only has four bolts around the cylinder, so head sealing becomes a problem. Also, it's kind of thin wall and moves around a bit. Uh, there's some guys that claim they get 1,400 horsepower out of these, but I challenge them to how long can they do it. And that's not, oh, I, I run mine hard on the street all day because that's not really running your car hard. But if you're actually out there, actually racing, actually doing stuff for real, uh, it's not going to hold at that power level. So the limitations are about 800 horsepower, 14 pounds of boost. Now, if you want to go more than that, you got to go to a aftermarket block. So uh, we use uh, RHS. This is the RHS block. We also use Dart or a couple of other manufacturers. We, we really like Dart too. Uh, the main advantage of Dart is it's uh, beefier than the RHS. Could take a little bit more power, but it, it weighs a little more. Um, this is the RHS block here that we just happen to have lying around. If you want all the details of this RHS block, go to our 1400 horsepower LS video. We'll have the link around here someplace. And I talk about every little thing about this block, but I'll just give you the uh, quick story. Uh, one of the main advantages of uh, 
this block, um, RHS, or the dart block, is you have more bolts per cylinder and more clamp load. This block, you have your four um, bolts, like your normal LS, but you also have two more here and here. So you have six bolts to really get good clamp on that head gasket, um, can hold a lot more boost. Uh, another advantage is the deck is a lot thicker. The deck is thicker, it flex less, uh, less, it supports the head gasket better, uh, you're less likely to blow a gasket there. Uh, this block has a really thick uh, iron liner. Like the LS, you can only belt, uh, bore it about 10 over. This thing, uh, it comes at 4125, and you can bore it all the way up to 4165. Um, so we built engines as big as um, 400, 477 cubic inches out of these, and they were sweet. Uh, another quick advantage is the, um, the uh, deck height is an is a inch higher than stock. Uh, this enables us to run like a, like a, up to a four and a quarter stroke, but we can run a super long rod, so the stroke to rod length ratio stays good and the piston speed and the, and the piston angularity and all that dig and stuff stays under control. Uh, having the, the stroke and a long rod is crucial for long life. A lot of other engine builders don't do that, but that's one of the things we do with our big stroker engines. Uh, the block is more beefy in general. Uh, there's more beef around the mains and all that, so there's uh, less flex. Uh, what we like about the dart block is it has even more beef down there. Uh, when you get into uh, the four digit power level and you start getting, you know, hammering these things with maybe 1200 horsepower, we've seen the uh, main caps fret. So that's when the dart block starts to become something you might want to think about. Uh, if you're going big power, like maybe 2000 and more, uh, the aluminum block probably gets kind of iffy. So uh, then we'd be looking at an LSX type block, which is something like this, but it's made out of iron, but has all the same features, the tall deck and the bolts and everything. Um, also, when you get to this level of uh, build, for crankshafts, we start looking at uh, really high-end billet crankshafts like Cali's. Uh, and for rods, we look at stuff like uh, Carrillo or Cali's. Those are like our high-end, super good rods. The other thing at this level um, is it's all about the money. Uh, this LS3 block is 1,900 bucks, and this RHS block is 6,400 bucks, and I consider that a deal for what you're getting. But you, you know, it's all about the money. You want to make big horsepower, you need money to play. So all the costs that we've gone over today, both for our baller and our budget builds, are basically for a lawn block. Uh, none of these include the cost of, for example, valve covers, or even with the mechanical lifters, you're going to require much taller valve, valve covers as well. Um, or oil pans, for example, we haven't discussed that. And most importantly, for a lot of you swap guys, we haven't talked about the accessory drives. That's a whole different topic. So, or intake manifolds. Or intake manifolds, or any of those accessories that go. So again, just lawn blocks is the only thing that we're discussing as far as the pricing goes here, guys. Now, if you need more details, yes, you can reach out to us. Please know that we get hundreds of emails and engine requests. So unless you're really serious, we're probably not necessarily gonna take the time of giving you an itemized list of every part that you need for your build, and we'll just refer you back to this video. So please understand that. And other than that, that is pretty much all we have for the LS build. Um, guys, if you like this content, you wanna see more of our videos, you wanna see more engine stuff, by all means, please subscribe, 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 tell all your friends, um, and we will see you next time for our next engine video. Come back to raise your Moto IQ. Nice.